This is Peter Godinas, your ambassador with KADY TV. Uh, with Meet the Candidate, and we have the absolute pleasure, and I mean this personally, to be interviewing Stanley Mantooth. And uh, we want to know who you are. I know I do. And if I may just call you Stanley during this interview, that would make it really nice. So tell us about yourself. Where are you actually from born? That might be a basic question we can warm sure. up to. I'd be happy to. But first, I would caution you not to call me Stanley because usually that's only what my parents call me when they're displeased. So, so Stan be, would be better. Okay, not Bubba, so just Stan, right? Uh, no, okay. I'm not Stan. from a state that far south. <laughs> Although the family's from Kansas, okay. and um, my parents actually met in a small high school in a tiny little town. The school had 60 students, and my grandfather was the principal and the coach and their science teacher. Uh, he, uh, my father's one of ten, my mother's one of eight. Uh, they did things like that back then when farming was not quite so corporate. And uh, yet it wasn't my dad's cup of tea, so he migrated out here just after World War II to Los Angeles and began a catering business. And I guess left my mom so bereft, she followed a year later and decided to convince him that he was going to ask her to marry him. Um, we, uh, they, they settled in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, I grew up right near the Coliseum and always felt like USC was the only university in town until my friends later from UCLA uh, disabused me of that notion. But uh, it, it, was, it was a great environment great place to grow up, great time to grow up. Um, myself and brother and sister and mom and dad lived in a one-bedroom apartment. So uh, we weren't replete with um, uh, worldly possessions, but uh, we had a great uh, time all the time. And it was one of those, uh, again, one of those times where you could go out and explore the neighborhood. And uh, mom would say, well, go out and don't come home until uh, we call you for dinner. And uh, uh, you know, that, that I think is something I always treasure. And um, when I was a teenager, uh, they had decided to buy their first home in Woodland Hills. And I didn't know where the heck Woodland Hills was at the time, but I knew it was out in the country somewhere. Because the 101 freeway ended at Mulholland Drive Valley Circle Boulevard at that time. And um, uh, so I was heartbroken, had to leave all my friends and start anew. And uh, so that kind of started a pattern for me of uh, moving west. So it's like Los Angeles, Woodland Hills, then later on when I got married, living in Agoura Hills, and then uh, finally uh, emigrating to Camarillo, California, and finding myself in Ventura County, which uh, I also feel very blessed to be in. You can't go any more west unless you move to Hawaii, is that the case? Oh, I, 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 you know, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, maybe uh, sometime, uh, you know, Halama Beach. <laughs> <laughs> well, how would you see, I'm, it just popped in my head, but how would your mom have described you as a child? I mean, that's, I think, a fun question. If she had to describe you, what would she have said about her, stand, her um, son Stan? Uh, probably far too much curiosity. Um, she, it was her fault. She taught me to read when I was three years old. Um, but I'm sure she would have preferred I'd be better behaved. And uh, someday she'd say, either come in the house or go out, you know, but don't uh, keep slamming the door. Uh, <laughs> it's basically one. Yeah, and uh, it's a great question, especially uh, because two days from now we'll be celebrating the 100th anniversary of Mother's Day. My goodness. And, uh, you know, she is a revered person in my life, and I am thankful that both my parents are still alive in their mid-80s. That's not something everybody can say. You know, one of the curiosity questions, at least for me, I want to know, you look very athletic, and I want to hear a little bit about some of the things you did athletically, and don't tell me you just went to PE class and that is, so <laughs> give me the truth. Yeah. No, I, I played sports uh, as long as I can remember. My, my father was uh, quite a good basketball and track athlete in his own right, and um, uh, when I got into high school, I couldn't wait to try track and football. Um, my particular handicap was uh, size. When I entered high school, I was five feet tall. When I left, I was six feet tall, but it was too late by then. Um, I consider myself to be a mediocre athlete. Um, I love track and field. I, my favorite event is the Olympic Games. Uh, and thank God they have the world championships in the off years, so I've got something else to watch. But uh, I tried my hand at football as a wide receiver. 
and I found myself probably, although I was quick and I had good hands, I found myself on the ground more often than not because it seemed like the uh, defensive linemen were always bigger than me and the cornerbacks as well. But still enjoyable, lots of fun, um, and I think it helped uh, build character, much like my golf game does. <laughs> I was thought think, um, uh, last name like Mantooth would be to your advantage playing a football player. Did you find that a real marketable name? Yeah, you have to have unusual names or a name that ends in SKI or something like that. <laughs> I know um, I'd change my name to Mantooth if I really wanted to really make an impression. Well, also if you wanted to have an American Indian heritage. You know, somewhere back about four or five generations, uh, you know, we were fortunate enough to have some Native American blood into the family. And that's when the name came about as well. And, uh, you know, it is, uh, it is something that once you hear it, you usually remember it, not without its uh, uh, teasing aspect when I was growing up. You can imagine all the iterations. And, uh, you know, I've often told people that if I hadn't found the calling I have, I should have been a dentist. <laughs> so after high school, you went to a higher education. Can you give us a little bit of background in regards to your higher education sure. experience? Sure. Um, as I said, there was no money. Um, my parents did not finance my college education. I was the first one in my family to go actually to full four years of college. And I started out in a community college. And I still think to this day it's a great deal. You've got smaller class sizes, it's uh, affordable, and the quality of instruction is sometimes deeper and as good as what you might see at one of the major universities. Again, that's the first two years of preparation. You're getting a lot of general education requirements out of the way. And uh, after that, I migrated to Cal State Northridge. And um, you can probably tell by the color of my hair that at that time it was called San Fernando Valley State College. Um, the name did change and uh, graduated there in 1975 with a degree in uh, geography. My specialty was climatology. Um, but at the time, there wasn't a big market for meteorologists. And uh, interestingly enough, my uh, my job was uh, working as a custodian in a school district. And, uh, you know, I figured, well, uh, the prospects aren't too great. Why don't I just see where my education and communication skills can take me in this world of education? And so, uh, even though now I consider myself to be an educator, having taught at the university for the last 10 years, I did not come uh, from the classroom ranks as a classroom teacher K-12 but was a support person. So starting from custodian, becoming a facilities director, business manager, and then uh, ultimately assistant superintendent of business and administrative services in a school district before I came to the County Office of Education in 1996. So along the way, uh, a few years after my uh, bachelor's degree, I picked up an MBA at Pepperdine. Hmm. So, the so only that's my educational story. Now that's a good one. I, I think what I missed was, so you did find that there were other universities besides U USC? Of USC, yes. Okay. Yes. That's right. what to make sure we knew that because I thought for sure he's a Trojan, but <laughs> we went on. We moved on. So no, that's a good thing. Yeah, I'm not one of those people that says my favorite schools are USC and whoever plays UCLA. <laughs> no, no, there's plenty, really plenty of room in my firmament for great uh, institutions of higher education. And we've got a couple right here in the county. That's very true. That's very true. You know, so I think one of the questions I want to transition to is, you know, what's, give us an idea of what you think the state of education is right now in California. Educate us as to what you think is going yeah. on. Okay. Um, we're probably in one of those situations where that could be described as not seeing the forest for the trees because we are in transition, but not just entering a transition. We've been in transition. Uh, probably since the turn of the century, entering the 21st century, and recognizing that we have to do learning and teaching differently. And it's got to be very, very child-focused, and it's got to embrace, embrace many of the principles of what we would call integrated learning. Nowadays, the new term is common core. And so sometimes you say, well, there's nothing new under the sun but it's involving things like writing across the curriculum. Okay, I'm not in an English class, why do I have to write an essay? Yes, you have to write an essay, even in physical education. You have to be able to practice those skills across the whole continuum. You have to be able to think uh, collaboratively and creatively, creatively working in teams, um, you know, all the kinds of things that you would find when you get out in the workplace. So 
whereas when many of us grew up and went to school, we were doing individual work and individual projects, sitting at individual desks. That isn't the way it works when you get out in the real world. You're in a team, you're around a table, you're brainstorming. And this is the kind of migration that we're involved in right now. Uh, at the same time, uh, we've just left behind a funding model that we, uh, some might say, suffered with uh, inequitably for the last 40 years, and that was the revenue limit. And uh, of course, having held the jobs I had, I've become intimately familiar with school finance um, and scare some of the students I've had at teaching at the university. And I will say uh, that it, that's a two-way street because they always intimidated me because this was in the graduate school and they were always teachers who were wanting to be administrators. And so I was always worried, well, what do they think of my lesson plan, you know, and am I delivering this the right way, and am I really challenging them, or is it just this dry topic on school finance that they have to get through to get their master's degree in administrative credential? It's very interesting. But, but again, uh, it's a great time in education, and I, I think we're going to see the results of much of this every single year going forward from this point in time. Um, technology use, for example. Not only uh, are we getting past the fact that, yes, the kids are very adept and they're very savvy, and you probably, you don't, but I have grandkids that at 18 months old are using a touch screen. But now there are teachers, and that generational change is bringing us people who are embracing technology as a tool and just taken to it like ducks to water so that they can really help the students and guide them in the most efficient and best way of a tool that all of them use that is ubiquitous now. Mm. For those people who are a little bit panicky because of this time frame of change, what people have a tendency to do, what encouragement would you give the, the population to say, you know, we're going to be okay? Mm -hmm. What would be some of the factors that you communicate? Well, despite certain test scores like PISA scores and articles which come out about how we're lagging behind, we are still the most creative, entrepreneurial, and greatest country on the planet, uh, maybe on several planets that we're yet to discover. And I think that, in many ways, uh, is it goes far beyond the number score on a particular test. Not that we don't have to have accountability, and we have to have testing. And I think the new testing platform that I failed to mention is also going to help, because it's a very adaptive test. But for some of our kids, uh, they're no longer going to have the opportunity to cheat because the test is so customized that the second, an the second question that comes after your first answer will be adapted to you and your learning style. And so it can't be duplicated by another student. Interesting. And that's the beauty of real one-on-one -on -one teaching and learning. I've never known that. That was very informal. Yeah, that's the new what we call Smarter Balanced Assessment System that we're piloting right now and it's going to be triggered for uh, use by all of the students in California next year. So do you see a lot of changes in regards to bringing more of the diversity on deck, meaning everybody on, uh, on deck, so to speak? Absolutely. We've got to raise all the boats. And uh, again, um, I, I know I wish I had unlimited time to keep talking, and then I would remember some of the things I forgot to, to tell you. <laughs> but with that new funding model that I've mentioned, uh, specific funding is set aside for students who are English language learners and students of poverty called supplemental and concentration grant funding which goes beyond the base level that every student gets. So the Common Core has embedded in it an absolute commitment to every student's learning but some students need more help than others and now we're directing resources, targeting resources directly to these kids which are, in many ways, a growing segment of our population. Our population dynamic is changing, and not everybody's going to be a one percenter. And um, so that's, that's the population that we want to make sure does not fall is into any kind of a risk category, so that they, too, become productive and aware people in our society that are contributing to it. And I guess if I could say anything to parents out there, it is, Change is our, one of our most important constants. Embrace it. It's not going to be the way it was. And a lot of people look at education as the, the way it was when they were in a classroom. And their opinions are formed about education because everyone's had an education. But it's much, much different. And I would encourage not only parents to, get, uh, to be aware, 
and to engage with their kids, but engage with the school. And, and I would defy anybody that goes into a modern 21st century classroom to say that education is failing. It's not. It's alive and well, particularly here in Ventura County. I would agree with you. Um, two questions I have left. I mean, is there a question that you think you would just hit a home run that you would like me to ask you? What do you think? <laughs> what do I want to see in, in what do I want to see in Ventura County education in the next uh, decade? My goodness, you read my mind. Yeah. You want to answer that one? Well, I, mean, I want to see. I want to see, and I'm expecting to see a lot of things. I'm expecting to see people more, more and more people of color in leadership positions and attainment. I'm expecting to see more and more parent involvement. I'm expecting to see much more early learning, and early learning meaning not just preschool, but before that, beyond, when the brain is in some of its most critical stages of development. And all of that investment early on is going to lead to other things, like those higher test scores, being more competitive, being more entrepreneurial, and having a lower or a higher graduation rate. I'd rather say higher graduation rate than lower dropout rate. It's amazing. Yeah. And I, I think a, as a whole, in general, because of the tools that are available to us, if managed correctly, it's kind of like riding the tiger with social media. <laughs> but that's the on-ramp, the great equalizer for every single individual in our society to be a part of what we do and to have a voice and to make the news instant. That's amazing. You know, the final question, is a little stress, the uh, staff was talking about former leaders, John F. Kennedy, saying we're going to send a, a person to the moon with materials we haven't even invented yet. We, heard, we were talking about Steve Jobs and how he said, imagine, if you will, you know, people buying products on, on the Internet. And he said that in 1995. So if I ask Stan Mantooth, imagine with me this, how would you finish that sentence? Imagine. That's a good one. That's a good one. You didn't prepare me for this. Well, you know, some of the best stuff comes out of my mouth when you're not first. But go ahead. Well, go let me it. preface that by saying I'm also a lifelong science fiction reader. Well, so this should be a and, good answer then. <laughs> and, uh, you know, during what they call the golden age of science fiction in the 1950s and 60s, it seemed like everything was way out there, you know, it was on the galactic scale. And then you begin talking about biological science fiction and all of the things that are being done in the medical field. But now the writers can hardly keep up. We're advancing so fast that now they speak more about social situations and social implications of technological advancement. And so what I'm looking forward to seeing is a much tighter culture, a more understanding culture, because our computers will essentially become biological. You're beginning to see morphs of that, like Google Glass. Um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit scary to think of putting very tiny nano machines in your body that will clean it all the time, you know. Uh, you know. You'll wonder what to do with yourself when you're living to be 200 years old. And I look, I look for us to solve some of the great problems that we need to address and get beyond some of our own personal selfishness, become more socially evolved, and work on big time issues like establishing permanent colonies off this planet solving the problems that this planet has with regard to its weather systems and environment and curing those things that we know we can cure because if you say if you identify the problem you can fix it even if you don't know how you're going to do it right now so i embrace your statement about jfk and uh you know going to the moon well i think they would all have been uh Exciting goosebumply uh, hearing your answer. So home run, if yeah. I may say. Well, I I look forward to hanging around so I can see as much of it as possible. <laughs> and uh, I just uh, you know well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, hope people get a feel for what makes me tick, and uh, how I got to be you know in a place like this. And um, I think it's the greatest work in the world. Stan Mantooth, you're the Ventura County Superintendent of Schools. We so much appreciate you coming in. Uh, it was wonderful. So thank you so much for the time you took out of your busy schedule to spend with our with our audience. Thank, thank you. Peter. Thank you. I love being a cheerleader. <laughs>